Good morning, Space Camp alumni, and today we are kicking off Virtual Fest. We are very excited to be connecting alumni today over Facebook and YouTube, so thank you for joining us. And this morning, we have a very special STEM discussion with two very accomplished gentlemen, and I'm very excited to introduce you today to Colonel Mike Mullane, and he is a former astronaut from the shuttle era, so we're going to be talking more about STEM and how STEM has impacted his career. And his son, Patrick Mullane, is the executive director of Harvard Business School Online. And he's also been a counselor at Space Camp and Aviation Challenge. So they're very familiar with the US Space and Rocket Center and the Space Camp programs. So we're gonna just dive in today and have a great STEM discussion. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us, glad to be here. Thank you. So I know I mentioned kind of up in the top that uh, you both are familiar with Space Camp and the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Could you share a little bit more about your your time there and what you you did there, Patrick? Okay, and Mike? First. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't remember the genesis. I think uh, Dad had been to the Space and Rocket Center several times and knew uh, Ed Buckby, uh, former, I believe, director of, uh, of Space and Rocket Center. And um, when I was in college, I had some interest in uh, a summer job uh, that would kind of marry passions of mine, because as you might imagine, I was kind of an aviation space buff. In fact, in college, I was in Air Force ROTC as well. So I was on, on my way to an Air Force career. And, uh, and so I spent two summers uh, there at Space Camp, as you mentioned, once with Space Camp itself. And then in the very, very early days, it may have been the first year, uh, you and I were talking, I can't remember the years, but uh, I believe it might have been the first year of Aviation Challenge. And uh, just great, uh, great experience. It was fun to be around uh, kind of fellow uh, STEM nerds, you know, and uh, yeah. people who really had passion around the same things I did. So that was how I ended up there. It's always great when you find your group. It, it, it's yeah. just, you find that connection and you find the people that are interested in the same things that you are. It's like, oh, I found yeah. my people. That's great. <laughs> and so, Mike, you'd actually come to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. I saw some really great photos where you had talked to kids that had come to space camp and and help them kind of learn more about STEM. Can you tell us a little there, bit about uh, that? I'm sorry. Can you uh, tell us a little yeah, bit Yeah, I was there. I retired from NASA in the Air Force in 1990. I think it was 1991 that Ed Buckby hired me to come down there for the summer. I was about two months, I think, in the summer of 1991. And uh, it might have been 92, but uh, <clears throat> I was. I spoke to, I think I, I remember, remember thinking I, that ended up as like I, I autographed 30,000 documents and spoke to, I don't know what it was, but it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, again, being with people who have a passion uh, for space, for rockets, for aviation, it's just, it, it was a lot of fun. I had a good time down there. That's awesome. Well, I think when you can find the people that love what you love, which in our case is STEM, and then be able to not only have those great conversations, but also inspire the next generation, I think it just kind of brings out something special in everyone. And it's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. So and you have a couple uh, alumni who are uh, astronauts now, what, seven or eight people? Or there's astronauts? actually, with this newest alumni class, there is 12 now. So with this new, are, new alumni class. We're astronauts now. Yes, there is two wow. more that were just inducted. Uh, with this most recent astronaut class, Bob Hines and Jasmine Mogabelli. And um, so now there's 12. And obviously, Christina Cook has gone up uh, and was recently on the International Space Station. So um, it's always great when we, you know, have astronauts that have been inspired as well. But obviously, that's a test testament to, to what the, what the uh, space camp does. It really sparks excitement, I think, in STEM in a lot of different ways. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So let's talk a bit about how um, you both discussion of how STEM kind of took your careers in a, a few different directions. So, Mike, how did you first get involved with STEM and become interested in it? Well, my parents, obviously, I think, are the root of that. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force, so we were always around airplanes as kids. And so I had a passion for it, for aviation. And as soon as I, I could vividly remember in elementary school, probably about third grade, when we when I was first told about the orbit, the planets around the sun, and we were to memorize the planets around the sun as nuns go to Catholic schools, drew the sun and had the concentric circles there. And, and I was just I, I vividly remember just memorizing that within a few minutes 
And later in the day, I was caught writing, you know, drawing and writing the planets in. And so now you need to put that away. We're working on English or history or whatever we're working on. But I, I just had a uh, it, it in, innate passion for all things associated with science, math, later with math and with engineering. And it probably was rooted in, in my parents, although my brothers and sister weren't necessarily passionate in that area. So I, I don't know, maybe you're just born with a gene that just says, you know, I'm curious about space right. or STEM in general. Exactly. Maybe we just have like the explorer gene. I don't know. It could be. <laughs> well, they brought, my parents bought, bought, fed that dream. I mean, fed that interest. They bought me books on weather. I was fascinated with whether I could end up being a meteorologist, um, chemistry, chemistry sets, erector sets, all of these other things that were related to STEM. Uh, that's what I would get for Christmas. Telescope one year, which was a real treasure. So they were feeding, they recognized in me uh, that interest and was, was, was feeding it. And that really helps when you have that support, to kind of right. that support yes. system to help you with what you're interested in, definitely. So you ended up joining the Air Force then for a time period. And where did that take you after you were in the Air Force? Yeah, I went to West Point, actually. The okay. I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy, but couldn't get in. My grades weren't good enough. Uh, which West Point took me, which is, I joke, doesn't say a lot about West Point. Uh, but uh, I went to West Point, uh, graduated, never really wanted a career in the Army. Uh, and when I graduated, I took my commission in the Air Force. <clears throat> And could not be a pilot. My eyesight was too poor. So I ended up in the back seat of fighters. Uh, I tell people, if you saw Top Gun, Maverick, and Goose, I was a goose, basically, okay. flying in the back seat of the F-4 Phantom Fighter. Uh, the version I flew was the reconnaissance version. Uh, but went to Vietnam, had a career, a uh, 23-year career in, in the Air Force. Uh, fortunate in 1970. Actually, in 76, I was completing the backseater course of test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base when they announced the selections of, that they were going to have a new crew position in the, in the new space shuttle that did not require you to be a pilot to, fly, to, to apply to. That was the mission specialist position. So I immediately applied to it and was fortunate enough in 1978 to get selected in the first group of space shuttle astronauts. That's amazing. That's exciting to be a part of that first group. And there's a lot of unknown with that. Was So the excitement was, I'm sure, just very palpable. And was there um, kind of this sentiment of you knew you were going to be the first ones doing this and it was going to be this long? Was there any kind of weight behind that? You know, kind of following up from the previous eras? Did you feel kind of a weight from uh, being the first group? Well, when, obviously when we... All of us, when we got selected, were in a passion to fly. I mean, we all wanted to fly. We just, you know, just let's let's get this thing flying. So it was that passion. When I was growing up, though, I watched all of the early you know, Mercury, Gemini, uh, Apollo. I, I watched it, and I wanted, as many people did, I wanted to be part of that someday. I I had resolved that if I wasn't I'd try for as high as I could get. And if that meant astronaut, I'm going to try for it. And a mission specialist uh, position opened that up. Uh, but I had re long resolved if I didn't get into the astronaut program, I was going to work in the rocket program and space program somewhere. So it was no yeah. question. I had that's one advantage I think in, that I had over my brothers and sisters, and frankly, probably a lot of kids, is that I was single mindedly focused very early on exactly what I wanted to do. I never had any wavering doubts about what to take in college or study. I mean, I knew exactly what I wanted from a very young age. And that, when you can focus all of your energy over eight, all these years, it really, it really counts a lot. And I wish I could go like that and give every kid a passion to whatever they're interested in to see early on it. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's how I ended up. That would make a huge difference because I do hear that a lot from different children, you know, alumni or, you know, I used to be a dance instructor. So, you know, it's talking with kids and that is kind of a big issue for a lot of kids um, where they're interested in a lot of things or they don't really know how to hone in that passion. Um, so I think that being able to try a lot of things early on kind of helps with that. But you can kind of zero in on what that passion is. It is really helpful to kind of focus in on what you want to do. And so, Patrick, you're growing up during this time period. 
and um, your dad's an astronaut. So what's that like? And I was fortunate in that uh, I was not, I never felt pressure to kind of live up to anything, at least not from him or my mother. I certainly, I think, put some, you know, weight on myself. Um, but as you might imagine, I had a deep interest in uh, space and uh, STEM sort of things. I mean, I built model rockets, I built remote control airplanes, <laughs> I definitely crashed a lot of them. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I. I also, you know, it's interesting when I look back on my childhood, I grew up in a, in a period where pop culture had a ton to do with it too. And it, it, a lot of people don't realize it, but we don't have the same kind of concentrated stories around exploration now. You know, it's all superheroes, right? Which is very different because when I grew up, there was a Star Wars franchise, which certainly still exists, but there was Indiana Jones. Uh, those movies were fantastic. E.T., uh, Star Trek started doing uh, their movies. Uh, so in a very really short kind of decade long period, there was a ton of pop culture around space and exploration. And I think that had a lot to do on top of living in an astronaut household and having an interest in aviation. And by the way, I had an interest in what he was doing long before he was an astronaut. You know, I was drawing airplanes and and, you know, going out to the flight line and watching air, airplanes take off. And you know, dad would <laughs> put us at the end of runways behind, you know, airplanes and afterburner blowing our hair off our, our heads. You know, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So I certainly had a lot of influence that pushed me in the STEM direction as well. It's a very different take your child to work type situation, isn't yeah. it? When they go stand next yeah. to those airplanes and see them in real life. This was more like kill your child at work day. <laughs> <laughs> when he was pretty young and his uh, sister, sisters were pretty young, but it, it was, I was stationed in, uh, in England at a base where they had a perimeter road, and you could get with probably within they had a little parking area within about 20 feet of where the planes were departing, these F-4 Phantoms with these thunderous afterburning engines. And I would take them out on night when there were night launches and park there and, and would roll down the windows. And when they was went into afterburner, maybe a formation of them, the whole car would just be shaken. And these kids would be I remember like, like, oh, wow, this is awesome. And then the, in the darkness, you could see this, this uh, flame just jetting out of these things. So it was a, a great sound and light show for these kids. They got indoctrinated very early. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great inspiration to have very early on. And so I wanted to talk a little bit because I know a lot of people that come to Space Camp or Aviation Challenge, they're very enthusiastic about flight or even going to space and, and they have that in their heart and that's kind of what their dream is. But then for some folks, they come and they really love STEM and they find another path that takes them another direction. So Patrick, I wanted to talk to you about your first degree is in mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so when you got that degree in mathematics, of course, I'm assuming you had to love math. That was probably the first step. Um, what was your kind of vision at that point when you went into mathematics? Well, it's interesting. I, uh, in this, you know, it's, it's not as um, maybe clear cut as it would seem because when I went to college, uh, I originally was going to major in aerospace engineering. In fact, the first two years uh, I went to college at Notre Dame, I did do um, aerospace engineering. But it's interesting, uh, Notre Dame, um, Nobody stays more than four years. I don't know why, but it's not a place where you go and you stay six years to get a degree. And since it's a Catholic university, um, if you're an engineering major, you still have to take all the philosophy and theology requirements as well, okay. which tended to load you down with a lot of coursework, right? Because liberal arts majors could count those courses toward their degree. I basically had to tap them on to what was already a pretty rigorous engineering discipline right. uh, of study. And um, and to be honest, I was struggling. I had a lot of hours. Uh, I probably wasn't as prepared as I needed to be going into college. Um, but I was on an RTC scholarship, so it wasn't like I could just say I want to be a poetry major. The Air Force didn't need poetry majors. Um, so, uh, so one of the options I had was to move into mathematics. And okay. since I was already taking, a I I went into it, and I really enjoyed it. In fact. You know, mathematics can either be considered kind of a STEM discipline, but it's also sort of a liberal arts, you know, it's a classical, uh, right. you know, liberal arts curriculum sort of thing, which have kind of unfortunately disappeared from a lot of colleges nowadays. Um, but um, most of the um, one thing I've learned running an online business now at Harvard is that uh, I'm shocked the number of people that I have working for me who are software engineers that do not have STEM degrees 
and have liberal arts degrees instead. And, and frankly, the other thing I find interesting, we're all often uh, really great musicians, a lot of them. Uh, I think the brain for certain disciplines uh, could really pivot pretty easily between, you know, one that seems very STEM and one that doesn't. Uh, all that said, you know, one, one piece of advice I give parents, and I do this with kids, um, and obviously working in university, I get asked these questions a lot, is when in doubt, if you think you're interested in STEM, always start with STEM. It is not, it, it, I don't care where you go to school, it is virtually impossible to take, uh, you know, go into school and say, I'm going to be a history major for two years, and then decide you want to switch to STEM and finish in any reasonable amount of time, right? You can certainly right. do it, but you're effectively starting all over again. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot easier to start in STEM and then decide, hey, maybe this isn't right for me or I want to pivot within STEM and move to something else. So I always encourage people to, when in doubt, start with STEM. That's that's great advice. And that's actually a really great point because there has been a recent movement to not just call it STEM, which, you know, I started out the conversation addressing the STEM, but actually now it's gone to more STEAM and it includes that art element. So you brought up a really interesting point of <laughs> Mathematics is a language. And so mm -hmm. people that understand those languages of mathematics, of uh, music is a language in itself. You know, reading the music and, and understanding the rhythms, it becomes a yeah. language. And so yeah, my son, uh, my son uh, got a theoretical physics degree at Stanford. And I was once visiting him and, and picked up his uh, textbook he had there, which I didn't understand anything. But, you, you know, if you're going to be a, a physicist thinking about you know, quarks and black holes and things like that, you better have a mind that's creative because it is not an easy thing to get your, to wrap your head around if you don't have a lot of creativity to uh, envision things that quite literally cannot be drawn. Um, I think that's uh, a great point when it comes to the art, artistic side of the brain as well. That's great. And so for a lot of um, students that are trying to figure out what to go into, they may think, well, I'm really interested in STEM, but how do I tie that creativity in there? And so that's a really great thing is to address where your passions lie and figure out how to combine them together. So you, for instance, you're, I'm just saying this is an assumption, but you have to be really good at mathematics <laughs> to get a degree <laughs> in mathematics, but you've combined that and you understand the language of business. And so now you are able to kind of transfer those things across yeah. multiple disciplines. Yeah. The one thing I know my dad will agree with me here too. The, the thing about STEM that sets you up no matter what you do, is critical thinking. There are there are so many people in the world, frankly, that are not good. And when I and when I say critical thinking, I think it's it's quite it's as simple as hypothesis, you know, testing a hypothesis, seeing what happens, and then drawing conclusions. And that's not just in a lab with test tubes. It's in politics. It's in science. It's in art. It's it's everywhere. And so, uh, getting that core foundation in critical thinking, I think, it's never going to serve you poorly. That's that's agree with that. In fact, <clears throat> another thing is just be curious. I mean, grow up curious about everything. We I know we're talking about STEM here, but if you can't communicate with people, if you can't read and write and communicate with people, really, you're not going to uh, reach your full potential. So I tell kids, hey, if you want to be an engineer, if you want to be an aerospace engineer or electrical engineer, whatever it is, great. But learn English too, and learn how to read and write and have a curiosity about history and just kind of open your mind and be Renaissance uh, types of, uh, of kids growing up. So you're, you're curious about everything. I'm, I'm shocked, frankly. Uh, I've been out in the public a lot. How few people have any curiosity. I, they've never looked at the sky. I, I mean, they've never gone out to look at a meteor shower. They've never gone out to look at, a, at an eclipse. They, it's just shocking how, how many people just have what I think is just a lack of fundamental curiosity about the world we live in and about all of those uh, subjects that are out there. So just, and always do your best. That's another thing too, is uh, uh, even if you a lot of kids going to college and they don't really know what their direction of their life is, but make sure you do your best. I get occasionally an email from some young man, usually a young man, uh, saying, well, I, when I was in college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I kind of kind of slacked off, didn't get good grades. And now they're in their mid twenties and say, now I I wanna I want to really get involved in space. How can I do that? Well, you're not gonna really be effective in that unless you get that STEM degree and going back at eight, in, in the middle of your twenties and maybe by then you're married, maybe even have kids or you have a mortgage, you have all these other responsibilities, it's much, much more difficult to go back and do that. 
better to do it while you're young, you have no responsibilities other than to yourself to get that education. And even if you don't want to just take a broad, uh, a broad spectrum of uh, subjects and be passionate about all of them and really try hard and get the best possible grade you can, because that will allow you many more options later in life. That's great advice. And it's so true because the older, you know, as your time goes by, you just get more responsibilities. So you yeah. know, it gets tougher and tougher and your your direction starts to just be cemented a little bit more. Not to yeah, say that it's when, not possible to, you know, explore still, but it just becomes a little bit more cemented. Yeah. Yeah, when he, him and his twin sister were born, my options in life got very, very narrow. He's never forgiven me. <laughs> I imagine with twins, that's very uh, time consuming. And with, it, with any children, I mean, when you have children, obviously you take on huge responsibilities then. And uh, so obviously you want to get your education uh, completed before you take those giant, giant steps of having, having mortgages and spouses and children. You know, just. You know, get it, get it while you're young and you don't have those responsibilities. Absolutely. And I totally agree with the idea of whatever you decide to do, just do your best and put your full effort into it because right. that's what's going to make you shine no matter where you end up and where, you know, yeah. life takes you. And I have a testimonial on that. When I was, uh, when I graduated from West Point and could not be a pilot, I knew I was never going to be an astronaut because at that point they had only test pilots as astronauts and I couldn't be a test pilot because I wasn't a pilot. So that option appeared to be dead being an astronaut, but I did my best at everything I was doing. When I went to graduate school to get a aeronautical engineering degree uh, through the air force, I did my best, did my best in the backseat of the Phantom, did my best in all the jobs I had in the air force. And all of a sudden 10 years after I think that dream of being an astronaut is dead. Hey, by the way, you don't have to be a pilot to be a mission specialist astronaut. And because I had done my best for 10 years when I didn't think it counted toward being an astronaut, I was very competitive. So always do your best. We can't see the future, but it's going to count. It counts in everybody's future. That's great advice. And so I know that we have a lot of alumni, myself included, that uh, kind of came to space camp during the shuttle era. And so we're very passionate people about the shuttle era and the shuttle programs. So can we talk a little bit more about the, the shuttles that you were on and some of the missions that you flew? Sure. Okay. So you, um, you first went on the uh, shuttle in 1984. Is that correct? correct. And you uh, were on 41D on Discovery. Right. That was, the, that was my first mission. It was the 12th mission in the shuttle sequence. By the way, a lot of people are shocked to hear there were 135 shuttle missions. So like lot, my first mission it? was the 12th. Clearly, I was at the very early stages of the shuttle program. And uh, that mission was, uh, we had a couple communication satellites to, to release and a solar array uh, prototype that was ultimately used on the International Space Station. So those were the payloads there. And then I flew again uh, in, in the second mission after Challenger in 1988. I flew on uh, Atlantis. It was a military mission. Can't talk about the payload other than to say I used the robot arm to release it. Okay. Uh, then on my my uh, third mission was another secret military mission that I can't talk about. That was in uh, 1990. It was the STS-36, but it was actually the 34th mission in the sequence. I just We ended up flying ahead of some uh, other missions because they were delayed for some reason. So... Well, that, you, that's a short version of my space shuttle history. And over that span of time, so obviously there was a bit of change happening because of different events that happened during that time period. But from 84 to 90, did you see a lot of changes with maybe the technology that were, you were using or just how things progressed or how it felt to be on the shuttle? Did you feel a noticeable change during that time period? I know Challenger happened in there, so there was probably some changes in sequence there. But um it, you know, during that time period, it seems like six years in technology, it quite a bit happened. So I'm just wondering if anything changed. Or actually, actually, no, I didn't think the uh, technology changed. I mean, when I climbed in the shuttles each time, they largely look like <laughs> the very first time with uh, 41D uh, in Discovery. Two changes. Uh, after Challenger, they added a bailout system and that changed some of the structure and the but 
largely there wasn't some giant leap in technology that occurred during the uh, later on when they went to a glass cockpit and some of these other upgrades. I, w- I was long gone uh, after, before that, but uh, it was kind of incremental changes uh, during the early years. That makes I didn't sense. See giant leaps in it. So incremental changes along, and then it works, you know, its way through uh, where you eventually go to have those more distinct changes with the shuttle, but then also then the International Space Station, you know. Right, yeah, the inter- first that. piece of the International Space Station wasn't launched until 1998, so I was long gone from NASA before that happened. Obviously, there was big technology changes with that. But you were laying the groundwork, so that's the really cool I'd like to think so. Yes. <laughs> well, certainly with the solar, so, certainly with those fold-out solar arrays, because we were the, we had that on, uh, on our uh, first mission. That's fantastic. So definitely laying the groundwork. I mean, that, and that's what it takes so you said 135 missions. It takes the collective, you know, knowledge that's gained through all these missions and all that testing. And Patrick, like you said, this hypothesis testing where you have to go through to be able to take all those runs at it to come up with at the end where now we're with the International Space Station. So it takes all that collective work um, to get to that next big project. And so now, obviously, we're looking to the future with Artemis. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a good point. Looking to the future, uh, could you all speak a little bit about your own personal goals for the future or what you maybe are planning on working on? And then we'll also kind of talk about um, the space exploration in general, looking ahead to the future. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I'm involved at the intersection of technology and education, and uh, we continue. And actually, COVID has, <laughs> you know, we are speaking with you as Zoom, yeah. has actually accelerated, I think, a lot of um, interest and uh, development dollars toward how do you truly make a, you know, a distance, well, not even just distance learning experience, but how do you make a distance experience, whether it be learning, whether it be an interview, whether it be whatever, feel like being in person. Now, I'm, I have to admit, this is an area where I'm a skeptic about technology, even, even given what I do. Um, I think that no matter how good it gets as human beings, and we see this, right, it's in our DNA to be around other people. You may not want to be around them all the time. You may not want to commute every day. But in the end, uh, people want to be uh, with people. And so I think, and and to be honest, I think that um, there are things that will make it harder to make leaps in technology if you can't be in a room together running an experiment, getting back to our scientific method, right? So, um, but I, but that said, I think there's still a lot that could be done and a lot that will be learned uh, on Earth, getting back to the space program. When you think about trips to Mars, uh, this issue of connectivity to human beings is going to be a big one. Um, you know, being you'll be connected to a few people, but that can be bad, too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> being connected to three, two or three other people for, you know, what will be a two year round trip, roughly. If you want to spend any time on Mars, you better get along with them and you better have outlets to allow you to connect with your family back home. Right. So I think there's some really interesting things that are going to have to happen to uh, solve those problems. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, I'm envious of kids today because uh, technology, technological development is exponential in nature. You know, it's a curve like this. So going back to what you were talking about earlier about the shuttle program, you know, in the 90s, what do you think about 1990 when dad retired from NASA? Um, there quite literally were not cell phones. I mean, there are a few people who might have car phones or a big brick they would talk on right, right? Um, I remember the and just, and yeah I just think of how much has changed now and it's not and now that cycle gets shorter and shorter and shorter and that's going to be true for a lot of technologies and we see it frankly with uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX right that that couldn't have happened back in the 90s that there people young people now are in a perfect intersection of kind of private dollars being available technology being available and a kind of a national and corporate will being there to, to do these things. I think that's really exciting. It is very exciting. And so knowing that we have these upcoming missions to get back to the moon, try to send our first cruise to Mars, what's it like knowing that you were a part of, I mean, it takes all of the pieces to get to those next steps. So I'm like, what's it like knowing that you were a part of laying that foundation? Well, I'm very proud of my contribution. Uh, there's a point there that I, I want to make too, is that People, another thing you need to do is learn how to work on a team, learn how to be an inspiring team leader and an inspired team follower, leader, you know, a a follower too. I mean, not everybody can be the leader, but uh, let's make sure we understand how to lead and let's make sure we understand uh, what it's like 
restaurants don't get into space. A team puts us there. A team of tens of thousands of people, uh, really great people. And so if you get those skills, in addition to STEM, you're going to go much, much further in life. So develop great team skills and, and leadership skills. Uh, but yeah, I'm pr I'm proud of what uh, we did. I mean, it's archaic now when you look back on it. Uh, you know, the shuttle, shuttle to give you some idea how how archaic it was. We would get our changes in our checklist sent up to us by teletype. And oh. That's World War II technology. There was a little closet in, on the shuttle where they had a teletype machine, and it would at night you would hear kind of softly. They were sending up for mission control changes to the checklist for the next day. You'd hear that soft kind of typing uh that was going on in there and then you open up the closet in the morning be this long long roll of, of teletype paper you tear it off and then you go through and pin and ink your your checklist <laughs> Not, that's pretty pretty archaic uh and of course we didn't have uh, digital cameras we had uh, film cameras possible uh, film cameras uh we didn't have uh digital watches uh certainly we had no email or connection to our families back on back on earth so it was, it was Kind of an archaic time, uh, but of course, when I look back, what they were doing in the Apollo program, it, it seems like <laughs> you talk talk about an archaic, you know, from what I experienced. I mean, you look back on that; it's amazing, absolutely astounding what was done in Apollo. I that's I still look at that and wonder that's a miracle that they that we got to the moon and uh, how those people, four hundred thousand people, worked to get there. Just incredible. I think I did see a, a small teletype in the Crew Dragon capsule they were hiding in the background, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, it was, it's right. all flim flam. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is amazing. And when you look at all the different programs, you see like giant leaps that maybe the people that are involved at the time, they know how big it is, but maybe not quite how big it's going to look when we're looking back on it. But there are those giant leaps when we go from program to program. And so it takes all that collective knowledge, like you said, from a team of tens of thousands of people to put that together and propel it forwards. And yeah, so that I've great people. Yes, yes. I've, mm -hmm. I've had the pleasure to talk to uh, a lot of our docents at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center who happen to be you know, from the Apollo era, different engineer positions. And so I've asked that question a few different times and I said, you know, at the time, did you feel a lot of pressure when it was, you know, that was said that you had to do this in a certain amount of time? It was kind of, you're just building the ship as you go along. <laughs> and so um, they said, you know, there was a bit of pressure, but we were very excited to do it. <laughs> so I think in that moment when you have that passion fueling you, um, I think that's really what propels everything along. So when you get tens of thousands of passionate people together, it's amazing what we can do. Yeah, I know when uh, I was sitting out there, people ask me, and they, I, it's scary sitting out on that launch pad on a show getting ready to launch. I, I, in fact, <laughs> it's terrifying. Uh, no, it's, uh, uh, you know your life's on the line. And people hear you make a trip multiple times and they ask, you know, how can you do it? How can you willingly place yourself in this danger of flying this rocket ship on 4 million pounds of propellant into space. And I tell them, the only reason I could do it, I think every astronaut would answer the same, is after working with these marvelous teams that support us, you know that every single individual on that team carries the attitude, whatever I'm doing, my piece of this big giant program will not fail. I will not fail these astronauts. I have their backs. And when you're around people that that you know have that attitude and are working with that ethic, it really, really makes it easy to get in board a rocket ship and fly into space. And boy, I, I like to buy them all a beer. <laughs> <laughs> that trust in team is essential. That trust in team is essential because it one person alone can't do as much as that collective whole. So that's really Absolutely. an essential part. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit what you all have coming up in the future as well. Um, so I know you both have blogs and I'll link those down below in the comments so everyone can check those out. Um, and you both have written a book if I'm correct too. Um, so yeah. Mike, go ahead. Well, I, yeah, years ago I wrote a book, uh, my, my memoir, Riding Rockets, The Outrageous Tales of a Space Shuttle Astronaut. Uh, that's out there and, uh, it, I think it's a great book. <laughs> it reveals a lot about me. One thing I would uh, say to parents that might be here, it's, it's got some uh, adult situations, adult humor, and adult language that, in my opinion, 
makes it inappropriate for very young kids. So you if, uh, you might want to read it as an adult and decide when it's age appropriate for your children because it's very young. Some, some situations and humor and language that, uh, that people need to be aware of. More for our adult alumni that are maybe <laughs> <laughs> well, reflecting. Well, for old, older kids. I mean, there's probably nothing that high school, a high school kid hasn't read or heard uh, in my book, but uh, I, I wouldn't put it on the library of the, uh, of the third grade library <laughs> at some, uh, some school. Got it. Got it. And Patrick, you also have a book as well. Yeah, I wrote a book called uh, The Father, Son, and Holy Shuttle, Growing Up an Astronaut's Kid in the Glorious 80s. And, um, you know, I touched on a little bit of kind of theme of growing up in that kind of pop culture time of the uh, early to mid 80s while dad was training uh, to go into space. And it's uh, at its core, it's really a coming of age story uh, about me, a, a humorous uh, coming of age story. Uh, I've been surprised, you know, when you write something like that, it's often you don't know what people are going to a, whether people like it, and B, whether they'll identify with anything in it. But getting back to something we were talking about before we started is there's a whole community of people out there who grew up uh, in a life very similar to mine. And I've been, you know, happy to hear a number of people say that the story, whether your father or mother was an astronaut, um, isn't the point. It's really about, uh, you know, kind of the funny things about growing up and uh, having an interest in things that, frankly, when you're a kid can often make you look like the local nerd, right, as we were saying <laughs> earlier, but that serve you well uh, later in life. Um, so I, and I should say, actually, maybe as I said, not, not falling far from the tree. My book also has some adult language and, uh, <laughs> and certainly adult humor in it. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, it, again, it's probably fine for somebody in high school because it is really about my kind of, you know, time between, say, 15 and 18 years old okay. is, is the focus of it. Um, but so anybody in that age certainly is probably OK, but it's Got not it. uh, it's not for, you know, fourth graders. So um, <laughs> it. it's been a lot of fun. It's and as I said, the best part about it is hearing from people who have a passion about space, who have uh, interest in STEM. And since everybody grew up and went through that weirdness and awkwardness, um, you know, people identify with that as well. It's always really great to be able to identify with people and find those people that have the same kind of passions and say, like, oh, wow, you know, there's more yeah. people like me out there. Yeah. This is great. And to be able to yeah. hear those experiences. Oh, I, for I forgot to mention, I think, as we discussed before, I have a, at my website, if, uh, if you buy a book there, I will dedicate it, you know, and, and send it to people priority mail. And I uh, have a coupon code that's uh, Safe Space Camp. I think you confirmed that, right? Yes, yes. Um, I looked at the message. Uh, that, uh, I, I don't know how many books I have left. So, I, uh, you know, the coupon code will eventually run out. But for those who buy a book using that coupon code, I'm giving $5 of every book uh, sold to back to the uh, GoFundMe uh, for you. Space Camp. So. Thank you so much. That's a part of the oh, Safe Space Camp effort. And I appreciate that. Um, and so today we're going to have a lot of different um, talks going on for Virtual Fest. So I will put all the information down below in the comments here of this video. Safe Space Camp, and it'll be on your website, PJ Malone. Is that, Malone, is that correct? Uh, PJ Malone, yep. yep. Yep, and I'll type it out so you got the yep. spelling and all that from, yep. so they can go directly to the link. So that, And you can also find your book on Amazon, but they need to go directly to your website to use that. If code. they want a signed copy, yes. Okay. I mean, certainly I'm happy to have them get it anywhere, but if you want a signed copy and you want money to go to Space Camp, uh, come to my website. Okay, great. I just wanted to yep. clarify that since it's a few yep. different places. Um, and so I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you being a part of our effort and speaking to the alumni today. I think that you know we have a really diverse group all the way from um, uh, attendees and trainees that are maybe younger and were here last year in 2019, all the way up to the kids that came and were really inspired by the shuttle area. So I think that we kind of talked about a number of things um, to appeal to all of our alumni. I appreciate your time and thank you for sharing your experiences. And um, we look forward to seeing what else you have coming up in the future as well. Yeah, so we'll be great. sharing those. Well, thank you, Diana. Yes. Yeah, hopefully we both can be at space camp sometime, maybe next summer, and come say hi. We'd love to. That would be right. fantastic. Thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, maybe next, uh, next, no, it's February, I guess, that uh, the Mars, the Perseverance arrives in Mars. Uh, I, I guarantee I'm going to be tuned in for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but, There's a bunch yeah, of that, exciting things getting ready to happen. So whether we're having to watch it virtually or whether we can do in-group events, <laughs> it'll be exciting to watch for sure. 
you. Well, Thanks, thank Diana. You, thank you for watching today. And we are going to be continuing virtual fest events all throughout the day today. So make sure you're tuned into the Space Camp Alumni Facebook page and YouTube. You can be watching our live events here, and I'll be sharing information throughout the day. So thank you to all of our alumni, and we will see you in our next live video. Okay.